and welcome to Victory Baptist Church. Come on in and grab you a hymn book. And hymn number 506 is what we're going to start off with this morning. Uh, great hymn of the faith, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And I hope you can sing that with all assurance. If you're saved, you should be able to, right? Hymn number 506 and begin singing. Do your best on that first verse now. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. The chorus is talking about the day. Hey, listen, I know I'm saved. This is my story. Amen. I know that I've been born again, blood washed, a child of the king. Is that you this morning? Is that your story? I hope you can sing it all the day long. On the second verse now. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture, now there's no my side. course now perfect submission always at rest I am my Savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with His goodness lost in His God this is my story this is my song praising my Savior glad you can praise him all the day long and uh, what a joy to see you this morning thank you for being here on this wonderful sunday morning first sunday in may Amen. well what's different about this sunday than next month's first sunday food day. next month is food day that's right and somebody's been paying attention and so next month we'll have food day so uh, you said why didn't we have it in may because we just had it last week and so big difference there and that, that begins next week but it's already may hard to believe we're already here uh, april showers bring may flowers they say right and uh, i'm looking out to see for the flowers which will start blooming but uh, it's good to see you this morning thank you for being here and uh, always a joy to have you here of course our, our members that are here but always a joy to have guests and visitors with us as well and uh, always exciting to see when somebody comes in and visits the church and and uh what boy it's it's even exciting to see when you come in and to visit, you have to look for a seat. That's a blessing, isn't it? And uh, what a joy. Used to come, it used to be a day and time where you just pick any one. It didn't matter. It was all open. But uh, thank God for the faithful members that come and, of course, visitors that come as well. Thank you for being here. If you are visiting with us this morning, if you haven't received a visitor card, we'd like to get one to you. And uh, ask that you just fill that out and drop that in the offering plate as it passes by. But I think, Brother Chad, you've already got those taken care of, right? And so for many of you, they've been praying for Miss Eunice Arnold, and that's Miss Amy's mom. She's right up here up front, and uh, she's been in the hospital. We've been praying for her for months, and God has answered our prayer. She's here today, and, and she's, uh, she's told us and, and told them, and when I get out of the hospital, I'm going to come to church and meet the folks who have been praying for me. And, we're, and, and she has said thank you many times, and, and I, I say for her, uh, on, on her behalf, thank you publicly. That way, if she doesn't get around to you, let, please know she says thank you for praying for her. And uh, it's exciting for us to see what God has done in her life. And, and, and then even the opportunity we had to, to talk to her about Jesus Christ. And she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior right there in the rehab hospital. Thank God for that. 
And uh, I'm glad that you're here. Glad Miss Amy's feeling better. Last week she was out, down for the camp count, and uh, Brother Eric was just kind of lost without you. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know where to go and he, if he was in church or not. And uh, two boys running around, they were yanking him all directions. And he was, he was almost crying for help. And uh, no, <laughs> but he's so much, so he's glad you're back. I'm glad you're back as well. Good to see you. And now let's pray. I ask for his blessings upon uh, the service this morning. It's good to see Miss Michelle back. Continue to pray for her dad. And uh, I want to see what God has done in Miss Eunice's life. I want to see him, him do that in uh, Miss, Miss uh, Michelle's dad's life. And uh, wouldn't, you say, can God do that? He can. Amen. He's done it before. We want to see him do it again, which I saw him Thursday. He looks a lot better than he did a few weeks ago. And so he's, he is improving some, but still has a long, long way to go. And so continue to pray for him. And I'm glad that you're here with us this morning as well. And uh, let's pray. Ask for those blessings. Brother Chad, thank you for holding the prayer meeting last night or yesterday afternoon, uh, morning, whenever it was. <laughs> and uh, and uh, grateful for that. He's very faithful. First Sunday of the month, he's or Saturday of the month, I'm sorry, he holds a, uh, just a prayer meeting in the, in the community there at the BB's gym. And so many, have been, uh, many of you have been attending with him to be an encouragement to him. And let me just say to those that have gone, thank you so much for going because you have been an encouragement to Brother Chad. It's not easy to start something like this in, in a community. You know how hard it is to get a prayer meeting going in church? <laughs> now try doing it out in front of the world and say, hey, y'all, come on, be a part. Right? It's easier to get them in church than it is into a prayer meeting. And so yet God laid us upon his heart, and we appreciate you being faithful doing that, Brother Chad. Would you ask the Lord to meet with us today? Amen. You can be seated. Let me just give you a few announcements, kind of make sure you're aware of what's going on. Next week is Mother's Day, and so uh, make sure that you will have planned and prepared to be uh, present for Mother's Day. Maybe you're bringing mom to church, and uh, that's a blessing, or maybe you're going to be at church with mom. By the way, having a church with younger families, if you see somebody out next week, that might be where they're at, that church with mom. And so don't get, uh, don't get too dismayed thinking, where did, where did everybody go? Sometimes that happens. And so, but let me encourage you, hey, be in church on Mother's Day. What a great way to honor mom than to be in church. And so let me encourage you to do that. And then just so you're aware as well, May 29th is Memorial Day. And uh, church, let me encourage you, if you run a, uh, across a... Uh, Run across a veteran, somebody that's either currently serving or has served, and you can tell they're a veteran, you ought to stop and say thank you. And Memorial Day is to, to remember, of course, uh, we have Veterans Day, but Memorial Day we remember those who have fallen uh, and, and shed their blood. But you, you shouldn't just be thankful when it's a day on the calendar. And uh, we try to teach our children, you see somebody in uniform, you walk up, you shake their hand, you say thank you. And uh, they have served, and they are serving on our behalf so we can have the freedoms that we enjoy. And we thank God for those who have served. And so let me just encourage you, on Memorial Day, be mindful of those who have lost loved ones. Uh, some have lost fathers, sons, daughters, mothers, and uh, many have been lost that we might be able to enjoy a church service like this without fear of somebody coming in and putting a stop to it. And whether we like what's going on in Washington or not, many died so we could at least have some sort of voice and say we want, to, we want these folks to be in. Now, America doesn't seem to choose right, but well, at least we have a voice. And, uh, and thank God for the freedoms that we have in America. And, and by the way, if it was so good somewhere else, why isn't everybody going there? You realize everybody's trying to come here of how good it is here and thank god for that and that's what that memorial day is about it's not just a day off of work it's a day to stop and remember those who have fallen on our behalf and then it's in june just some events that are coming up in june so enjoy uh may while you can because as soon as we hit june it's going to be very very busy for for many of us in june we have our family saturday on june 3rd first sunday fellowship on june 4th and then on wednesday june 7th we'll have another missionary in uh the bishop family missionaries to mindanao and uh, they'll be our special guest and you say, where is Mindanao? Now, only a few of you know. Anybody besides Brother Drew know where Mindanao's at? Well, Tino's on the Philippines. <laughs> uh, you're assuming. And uh, it is in the Philippines. And, hey, the, they're going specifically to, to the Muslims in Mindanao. And, by the way, it's a very dangerous place. 
There's folks from Mindanao. Brother Drew, his wife is from there, and we're still praying for her to get saved. And, and uh, his wife is from the northern part there. He was just telling me, he said the southern part where the, where the Muslims have control, it's very dangerous. I mean, they'll put you to death. And this is where this family is going. And so come and be, a, be our guest. You say, how is that possible? Listen, we just had in our missions conference a, a missionary family going to North Korea, right? And a family going to China. You're like, how is that possible? Hey, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible, right? Hey, all I know is if God's going to lead it, hey, Lord, you just you lead it and we'll follow you. And uh, let God take care of all that. But uh, that's June 7th, and you come be a part of that. And the teenagers begin to get ready. June 19th to the 23rd is our senior camp. We're going to go to the Dry Creek Baptist Youth Camp in, in uh, Dry Creek, Louisiana. We've never been to this camp before. I've explored it uh, myself uh, for uh, about a day or so. Looking forward to the camp. I think it'll be uh, a great time for, for us. If you have a teenager, 7th uh, grade and up, 7th grade and up, and, and they have never been to camp, let me encourage you, send them to camp. We said, but they don't want to go. Send them to camp. But we don't have the money. Let's find a way to raise the money. We'll send them to camp. And you said, but it, they're just not into that. Send them to camp. Listen, you, when you're your junior kids, listen, when we have our junior camp from third grade to, to sixth grade uh, in July, if they've never been, send them. You say, why? L listen, it may be that week that they turns their life around. My very first senior camp, I went just as a kid, had no idea what was going on. I'm 16 years old, ready, ready to kind of go into the world, have my own thing. God got a hold of my heart, and I came back from camp, fired up for Jesus Christ. Didn't think I was going to do that. Yet I was ready to serve the Lord. And you know what? I think that began the catalyst that eventually led me to right here. Imagine you decide, well, your kids don't want to go, so you say, well, I'm not going to make them. You made them eat their vegetables. You make them go to school. How many of you ever said to your kids, go to bed? Yeah. See, the problem is we don't realize how important it is. See, we've misplaced the priorities. And so let me encourage you, send them to camp, and uh, it'll be good for them. And you say, but they've never been without me. I'll be with them. <laughs> I'll take good care of them, okay? And so we look forward to camp. Camp Teenagers is $180 a uh, camper, and uh, it is uh, plus spending money if you want any spending money. And uh, we should have this week, we should have some chocolate in so you can begin selling chocolate. And I'm going to get with some teenagers and, and Brother Matthews when they get back. We're going to try to set up a table down at Walmart and see if we can just sell all the chocolate all at one time. Wouldn't that be a blessing and just, and, hey, nobody having to go door to door or anything like that. Just, just get it all gone and raise all the money that we need for camp. And we're going we're gonna to try to do that. And so you know, get, we get it for them and we we'll, might need some help with that. If mom's able to work two lots, they need to let me know ACP because I'm going to be placing my order. Okay. If you need culottes for camp, and uh, we'll get into some more details. That you said, what, what are culottes? That's what our girls wear to camp. And uh, if you need more information on that, then uh, see my wife and she can help you to, to worry. By the way, if you have boys, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Praise yeah. the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, yes. And so, hymn number 78. Take your Bible, or Bible. <laughs> hymn book, hymn number 78. When we all get to heaven, sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Let me hear you sing all that first verse. Hymn number 78 now. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his Shout the victory. It's even get louder on that second now. While we walk on the shake hands and we'll sing those next two verses here in just a moment.
verse now. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory, where the cause of life we pay when we go. Today that will be ushers you come on ahead and as we prepare for the offering this morning and what a blessed day to give unto the Lord a portion of that which he's given unto us and uh, you know I was singing that as I'm leading the last two verses used to be I could get around and shake everybody's hand during handshaking time I can't anymore I can't I miss so many people and I and, and I think of I, I well well I, I enjoy the folks I'm able to go to church with. Amen. And so just thinking about that, and what, what a joy. If I didn't get by and shake your hand, I want you to know I, I'm so grateful you're here. Everyone's important, and, and we're, we're grateful that not just because you're here, but that God has an opportunity to work in all of our hearts. Amen. And uh, what, a, what a joy to be able to be in attendance together, serving the Lord. And your faithfulness is a great encouragement. Can you imagine trying to prepare a sermon to people and you never know if they're going to be there? Some Sunday school teachers might understand. You prepare for Sunday school and you don't know who's going to show up. You know what? It's those who are faithful that, you know what? They keep you going. And so thank you for those that are faithful. And uh, we praise God for it. And uh, praise God for those. Hey, if you're just visiting this morning, thank God for visitors too. That, that makes it really exciting. And so we enjoy that. Good to see Brother Drew this morning. And uh, you pray for his wife. She flew out this morning. Headed to the Philippines for three weeks, and uh, again, she, that's where she's from, and so go, going to visit family, and so pray for her, safe travels, and of course, safety for him as he's busy going and doing to and from work and taking care of everything at the house all by himself now for three weeks, but uh, he's sure a blessing to see him here with us this morning. Let's pray, ask those blessings upon our offering, and as we pray, Brother DeVito, would you ask the Lord to bless our offering, please, sir? Amen. Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Brother Hood, Sissy's trying to, she was missed in the offering, and so, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, 
Just like a preacher here, you see money waving in the pews. You're like, hey. <laughs> hey man, I'm more, more worried about that visitor card. That's more important to me. And uh, showing that Miss Sissy was here with us. 463 in your hymn book now. 463. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And thank the Lord for that. 463. Got a little echo going in the, uh, in the chorus here. If you know how to sing different parts, go ahead and sing different parts. And the 463, sing with me now. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. And the same of earth shall gather over on the other shore. And the roll is called the yonder I'll be there. to you sing. I almost wonder if the kids are more excited about this roll call than the adults. And you say, well, kids know how to deal with roll call. They're still in school. I'm glad my name's on this roll. Amen? Amen. And uh, hey, listen, let me hear you adults uh, uh, singing. Hopefully the kids don't out sing you. Hey, they're usually in children's church on Sunday morning. They're with us now. And, <laughs> and so, adults, give it all you have on that last now. Let us labor for the master from the dumpest heading sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. And when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the road is gone glad to be there amen you can be seated thank you for singing so well and uh, we enjoy the fact that our kids know how to sing in church amen and uh, that's pretty exciting I've seen kids in church that don't know how to sing not even Jesus loves me and so I'm grateful that we have kids that not only know how to sing but they do sing and they sing out unto the Lord and uh, all right. Well, this morning, if you'll take your Bible with me to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, and we're going to go to uh, a passage of Scripture uh, that's very interesting. It's very well known, but interesting. I've seen, for those that don't know, there's many Jews who don't believe that Jesus was Messiah or is Messiah, that He is the Christ, the, the coming King. And... Uh, I remember a, a Jewish evangelist one time told me he was witnessing to a fellow Jew and he took this chapter that we're going to read this, this morning and he just printed it on text. No verse markings, no title from where it came from, just paragraph form. And he said, I found this, I thought you might be interested in it. See if you read it. And he took this chapter in, in the book of Isaiah and he began to read it and as he read it, he began to get angry and he threw the paper back to this guy and he says, I've told you, quit trying to force me to, to read and learn about your Jesus. And he took that paper and he picked it up and he said, just so you know, this is in your Torah. Yep. <laughs> it's that clear. The very Jesus they reject when, he, when faced with just reading it here and, and not understanding that it was out of his own Torah, his Bible, his Old Testament. He said, that is Jesus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And those of us which know him can see it very clearly. Amen. Isaiah chapter 53, and what an what a infamous passage this is. 
Isaiah in chapter 53. This is a very prophetic chapter and a chapter about the sufferings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice the things that, that's prophesied about him. And by the way, every prophecy in Isaiah 53 came to pass through Jesus Christ. Every one. Not one was left out. And so Isaiah 53, and uh, it begins this question. And, and I want you to consider uh, as we begin to read in here, there's a, couple, a few questions in Isaiah 53 that begins with, and it says, Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And as we read those, I want you to consider... New Testament Christianity for a moment. Who really believes God's report? The world? No. The church? Should. Do you believe the Word of God this morning? I hope you do. Hey, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Where do we see God at work? Name me another entity on the face of the earth beside the church where you see God physically, at, I mean, at work and active. He works through the ministries and the lives of his church. That's why he's established his church. And without the church, boy, you take the church out, the world's in trouble, isn't it? And so even consider this. Listen, the church is key in New Testament Christianity. And so if, as we begin reading Isaiah 53, if you'll stand with me, if you're able to, and uh, in honor of God's word, if you are not, we understand, and we want you to go ahead and stay seated. Isaiah 53, notice what the scripture again says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found, or was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, for he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and, his, and he was numbered in the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, if you could not tell that we're reading about the crucifixion of Jesus in this chapter, you were not paying attention. But I want you to notice verse 10, a very interesting verse right in the middle of talking about the sufferings of our Savior. That very first phrase, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That doesn't seem to make sense, does it? When Jesus suffered for you and for me, it pleased the Lord. Amen. Look with me at verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By watching his son die upon the cross, the father looked down and seeing the travail of his soul, he was satisfied. And what was satisfied? It was not pleasing to him as a, as a joyful thing. You have to understand scripture. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? 
Listen, when Jesus came down from heaven and hung up on that tree, listen, God looking from heaven at the travail of his son's soul, God looking down from heaven at the bruising of his son, it was all done because God loved you and because God loved me and he wanted to see you saved. And finally, the price for sin was met. And listen, there was not going to need any more death, no more sacrifice, no more blood. It was finished. And it pleased the Father. You ever just want to please the Father? I want to ask you this question as we just consider this, these verses to, this morning. How much is too much? The scripture says it pleased, it pleased the Lord. Do you want to please the Lord? How much is too much? Let's pray, and then the message. Lord, I pray you help us to be mindful of your son this morning. As we meet, Lord, pews are full, and yet I know hearts are also burdened. And God, I pray you'd help us to see your son this morning, to see what you've done for us. May it please us to know that you've loved us so. But God, may it also Challenge us to live our lives in such a way that we want to please you for all you've done for us. I pray this morning you take the message and you'd stir our hearts. If there might be one that does not know you as Savior, Lord, I pray this morning they would trust you as Savior. If there might be one who's going wayward, Lord, I pray this morning they would come back to the cross. If there might be one, Lord, who needs strength and encouragement, would you encourage them to stay faithful to you? Do your work within us and through us, and let not your, re your word return void, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As a child, my heart's desire was always to please that of my father, please the heart of my father. I wanted to hear him satisfied. I wanted to see him pleased. I remember as a kid, Listen, learning to mow the yard, and I liked hearing Dad say, hey, that looks nice. I remember working on the car, and times when I would work on the car with Dad, and he would let me do the, do the work with him, and he would say, Wait, good job, son. And I remember listening as you, you watch those things. There were times, of course, I did not do such a great job. There were times when I did not quite please him. But that was my heart's desire. And can I say that as I've grown as a Christian, listen, truly my heart's desire is just that I please the Lord. It's not that I please man, and, and, and I want you to understand what I'm saying. As I stand behind this pulpit, this sacred desk, as I pastor this wonderful church, my heart's not desire is that I be a wonderful pastor for you and, 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 and preach a good message for you. Listen, first and foremost, I want it for him. I, I, I just want to honor him. I want him to be pleased. And Listen, if man turns their back on me and God is pleased, then, then that's all I should desire. If man is pleased and God is not, then my heart is truly not right with God. And I, I want the Father to be pleased. And can I say as I consider this verses here and to think of the Father looking down at his son and watching him bruised, have you ever just saw for a moment by faith what Jesus endured for you and for me? Have you ever just envisioned for a moment when they tied his hands to the whipping post and that cat of nine tails was brought across his back? Hey, the Bible says he endured that scourging. And that cat of nine tails, history tells us, would rip into a man's flesh in such a way that many times his bowels would fall out. And this is what Jesus was going. It wasn't just three nails in his, in his hands and his feet, my friends. They would take his body, and listen, after he endured that scourging, they'd put a robe upon his back and a crown of thorns upon his head, and they would take a reed, or if you would, a, a piece of wood, and they would begin to smack him in the head. Now, that would hurt by itself, but they would do it to drive those thorns into his brow. Now, I know we have the kids that are in here with us this morning, but kids, you need to know what Jesus went through for you. You bet. Well, you shouldn't talk. That's all. That's just gory stuff. We shouldn't tell our kids. No, our kids need to know what Jesus went through. Amen. Hey, he went through this to pay for your sins. And listen, he had to go through this to pay for your sins. And Amen. listen, your sins are that bad. Well, my kids haven't done anything wrong. No, all, we know our kids. 
Every kid has done something wrong, including mine and including me. And it was our sins, no matter how good we think they are, which no sin is good, Jesus had to pay the same price for them. And listen, that those nails that were driven through his, through his head, listen, or, or, or thorns driven through his head, and they would blindfold him and walk him through a crowd and they would smite his face and they would spit upon him and, and they would say, if you're really the son of God, tell us which one of you or what, which one of us hit you. Tell us who did that to you. And as we read here in Isaiah, he said not a word. Yeah, Eventually they would take that robe that was on upon his back and they would rip it off. You ever had a Band-Aid ripped off? That don't feel good, does it? Can you imagine your entire abdomen ripped open in that robe and the blood coagulated with it? You said, that's, that's worse than I ever thought. That's what he endured. The Bible tells us his visage was so marred. His appearance was so beaten, you couldn't tell who he was. He didn't look like a man. And he did not look like the man you knew. The pictures, my friends, of Jesus hanging upon the cross with a little trickle of blood coming from his brow and just a few nails and a little wound in his side, they paint not even close of a picture of what he endured for you and me. When they hung him upon the cross, can you imagine as they laid his body down, his whole back ripped open, listen, just open wounds, laid him upon not a smooth piece of wood, but the old rugged cross. And my friends, listen, they would stretch his arms out and as much pain and agony he was in, they would begin to drive the nails through his hands, through his feet, and with every blow, the scripture says it pleased the Father. So it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. The Bible tells us for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Amen. His joy was knowing that by him going to the cross and shedding his blood, by God putting all judgment upon him for every sin ever committed, that you and I could be saved. Amen. The joy was, listen, you, my friend, your soul and your life and your family and your heartaches and your burdens and your sorrows. And without Jesus going to the cross, there was no hope. And can you imagine Jesus as he laid here, listen, on the cross, at what point in his life, at what point in his suffering did he look up to God and say, God, it's too much? Thank the Lord he never did. Amen. Through the scourging, he never said, it's too much, it's too much, I can't do this. Hey, through the, through the crown of thorns, he never said, it's too much. Through the, the beatings that he took, listen, physically, he never said it was too much. Through each nail put upon his hand, he didn't say it was too much. And when they lifted his body up and let it suspend there upon the cross, hanging between heaven and earth, he did not say, it's too much. And it pleased the Father. And he was satisfied. The songwriter said these words, See my Jesus, on the cross. The people crying. Looking on, a man would think it tragedy. But what the world could not see was when they nailed him to that tree, he would break the chains of sin's captivity. Love grew where the blood fell. Flowers of hope sprang up for men in misery. Sin died where the blood fell. And I'm so glad his precious blood has covered me. Thorns of violence and of hate were growing wildly, and the sorrow they had caused was plain to see. But when the blood came streaming down that cross... Where my Jesus bled and died, it started blossoms of forgiveness growing free. Again, love grew where the blood fell. Flowers of hope sprang up for men in misery. Sin died where the blood fell, and I'm so glad this precious blood has covered me. Amen. My friends, you ever just saw the cross for a moment? You ever just saw the cross? 
And then I want you to ask yourself this question. While you look upon the cross, while you see what he endured, while you see his sufferings, while you see his agony, while you see his travail, while you see his blood, listen, is there anything that's too much for God? So what do you mean, preacher? Is it too much to love God and others more than ourselves? Is it too much to love God and others more than ourselves? Hey, a lawyer came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, and they asked him a question, trying to tempt him. They said, Master, what is, which is the great commandment in the law? Can you imagine the question? Hey, of all the laws, hey, over 600 laws in the Old Testament, of all the laws, which one is the greatest law of them all? <coughs> Jesus answered that. And he said to this lawyer, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And this is the first and great commandment and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He said, what does he mean? Listen, every law in the word of God, everything the Bible says hangs on the fact of whether or not we love God as we're supposed to and we love others as we're supposed to. Everything. Now listen, my friend, is it too much for a God in heaven who allowed his son to suffer and bleed and die for your sins and for mine as he endured the cross? Is it too much for him to ask, would you love me? Now, if I took a poll in this room this morning and I said, listen, how many of you love God? Listen, I think every hand would be up. Preacher, yeah, I love God. I love God. And listen, but do you love God according to how Jesus said we're supposed to love God? Did you notice? He said with all thy heart. Well, I'm going to give him half my heart. Let, let me ask you, those, those of you that are married, you stood at that wedding altar or before the justice of the peace. And I don't know, people get married in different places. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with either one. Hey, show me in the scripture where you're supposed to get married in front of a church. It's not there. So if you were married to the justice of the peace, hey, your marriage is just as much a marriage as mine is. Okay? And let's say you stood there, you looked at your wife, and wife, you looked at your husband, and, and listen, they asked, do you? You said, I do. And, and they said, will you? And you said, I will. And, and then you, you put a little disclaimer at the end. I will love you with half my heart. <laughs> How many of you said that would be good enough? I'm taking a poll. Half my heart. Not even the kids are raising their hands. <laughs> wow. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to Lord, love the Lord thy God with all your heart. Hey, listen, my friend, what comes between you and your God? Do you love God with all? Listen, people say they love God, but let me just, let me ask a question. Is there enough evidence in your life that proves that you truly love God with all your heart? If you stood before a courtroom today, accused of loving God with all your heart. What would be the evidence that would be brought up? Oh, I went to church Sunday morning. Well, your Honor, nobody goes to church on Sunday morning unless they love God with all their heart. Do you see what I'm saying? Listen, what in your life shows that you love God with all your heart? Can you be convicted of putting God first in your life? He said, not just all your heart, with all your soul, with all thy mind. In another place of scripture, he said, with all thy strength. Yep. Can you be accused of putting God first in your life? Jesus said this, if you love me, keep my commandments. Kids, aren't you glad that's not how we teach you? If you love me, clean your bedroom. Now, by the way, if you don't honor and respect your parents and you don't clean your bedroom, you're not showing your love. Mama, I love you, but you haven't done a word I've said. Get in that bedroom and you clean that room. <laughs> but Mama, I love you so much. Can we get some ice cream? No, what you're fixing to get, you're fixing to get your hiney little, little sore right now. And that's what you need. You don't need ice cream, yep. right? Yep. And listen, we say, God, I love you with all my heart. I love you. Oh, God, I love you. For one hour a week. How much is too much? 
Is it too much to put God first and then also love others as yourself? How many Christians today are out of church because somebody else did fill in the blank? So-and-so did this. And you know what? When I came to Sanger, there were folks that I told them, I'm going to start a church in Sanger. I was working in Gainesville, and people said, oh, you're going to start a church in Sanger. Huh, really? Listen, let me tell you something about Sanger and these towns that are around here. Listen, I'll tell you stories about deacons and about da 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 this person, that person. And if Christians are like that, I don't want to be any part of it. And I said, you know what? If we're going to love people like that, how do we say we love God like we're supposed to? Last time I checked, I'm not in church because some deacon. I'm not in church because of some church member or, or the treasurer or the Sunday school teacher. I'm in church because I love Jesus Christ. And hey, listen, let some deacon or somebody else go haywire, go the wrong direction. I'm sorry, my friend, you're going the wrong direction. And by the way, in Victory Baptist Church, if we ever elect you deacon, you go the wrong direction, we're just going to elect you out. We're not going to keep you in position. I'm not going to hide your stuff. I'm not going to sit there and tell the church that you're doing everything right and you're going to stand and be a pillar and an example of the church when you want to live in sin. If you're going to do that, hey, listen, you do that on your own time. You say, why don't we have deacons? Maybe that's why. Hey, that goes for everything else. Hey, just because you hold a position doesn't mean we just cover up your sin. Hey, we're to love Jesus Christ. Every church member is to love Jesus Christ. Every Christian is supposed to love Jesus Christ. And can I say we're to love others as ourselves? Let me ask you. Sometimes we say, well, I'm not in church or I'm not serving God because what so-and-so did to me. But my friend, what have we done to him and what have we done to others? There's no reason for us to quit. How much is too much? Could you look at Jesus hanging there upon the cross, blood flowing down from his head, wounds open on his side, and could you look at him in his eyes and he looked at you and said, well, listen, why don't you love me? Would you really look at him while he hung there and say, because of so-and-so? Could you? I think that's why we don't love him because we don't see what he's done for us. Taking our eyes off of Jesus. That's why Paul told us in the book of Hebrews, we're to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And is set down to the right hand of the throne of God. Is it too much to be faithful to God? Not just love him, but be faithful to him. Let me use that marriage analogy for just a moment again. I love you with all my heart, but you're unfaithful. Right? Why, if you look at your husband and you went, well, I know you love me, but he just can't help himself. There's not a wife in their right mind that'd say that. <laughs> Maybe she'd grab that 12-gauge shotgun and she'll say, I can't help myself either. Shh, shh. Right? Hey, there's not a husband in this world that says, you know what, she loves, I know she loves me, but you know, she's just, she just unfaithful. That's all. It's okay. No. You know, you know what we would do? We'd grab that same shotgun and maybe we might not shoot her, but there might be some fella out there that, hey, I'm sorry, but we're fixing to have a funeral. <laughs> right? Hey, you say that's, that, is, that doesn't go. Wait a minute. But you know the Bible tells us that as Christians, we're to be faithful to him. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Consider this for a moment. Hey, Paul said here, Moreover, it's required of stewards that a man be found faithful. And, and here is he's talking about stewards. He's talking about, listen, uh, ministry, and of course, the preachers and stuff. Uh, but I want you to consider for a moment, what, what, what is he talking about? What has God given us to be stewards over? Paul is talking about being a steward over the Lord's ministry or a manager of the ministry of the Lord. Hey, being a steward or a, the word steward itself. Noah Webster describes it as a, uh, uh, in this context, Context, as a minister of Christ whose duty is to dispense the provisions of the gospel, to preach his doctrines, and to administer its ordinances. Listen, as a steward, uh, as a steward and as a pastor, you expect me to preach the whole counsel of God, don't you? You expect me to stay true to this book, don't you? You expect me, listen, what, what if you just didn't like what I had to say? You still want me to say what's true, don't you? Yeah. Hey, listen, that's what you expect. Why? Because I'm, I'm to manage what God has given us in such a way that it helps you, right? right. Now, the word steward used in that context, that's what he's talking about. But you realize that we're not just stewards over ministry. Each one of us is a steward. 
So what are you talking about? Name me something that belongs to you. Well, you begin to list things left to right, so you're, you're, you've already messed up. The first law of stewardship is understanding that you own nothing. It all belongs to God. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That's my car. No, actually it's God's. Because without God, you wouldn't have it. Well, it's my house. I paid for it. Oh, really? Yeah, who gave, you this? who gave you the job? I wonder how many people ever prayed for a job. Anybody ever prayed for a job? Look at all the hands that are raised. Yeah, did God give you one? Yeah. And yet we say, it's my job. No, Lord, you gave me this job. I wonder, anybody ever had an ability where they hired you for a job because you could do this and that? I wonder where those abilities came from. Well, my dad trained me. Yeah. Huh. Who gave you your parents? Children are an heritage of the Lord. Hey, parents, don't you realize our kids don't even belong to us? They're his children. Given to us all alone to raise them for him. They don't even belong. Listen, nothing in this world belongs to me. It's all his. And that's where a lot of folks get all ruffled up. Really? How much is too much? Come on. Jesus, this isn't your life. Could you say that to him while he hung on the cross? Listen, would you stand there as you saw the Roman soldiers driving that nail through his hands? Would you stand there as you heard him crying out in pain and say, it's my life. I can do what I want to. Thanks for saving me. Really? How much is too much? And he says he wants you to be faithful with everything he's given you. How about your time? Yep. Well. Are you faithful in your time to God? Well, preacher, you're talking to people who are in here in church. Huh. When are we supposed to be in church? When the doors are open. You know how often that is? These doors are always open. <laughs> but doesn't the scripture say to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, which is a like manner of some? That's right. Hey, Sunday used to be known before our world became more secular. Sunday used to be known as the Lord's, the Lord's what? Lord's not the Lord's morning. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. The Lord's what? Day. Day. You know why we have Sunday morning and Sunday night? Because we stop. Listen, the Bible says, hey, these words shall, shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein both day and night, he told Joshua. You mean there's kind of principle to having church in the evening? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You mean, preacher, to be faithful to God? Are you telling me that, are you trying to put me through a guilt trip and say that I need to be back here? No, I'm, if you're guilty, that's just you. I'm here. I don't, got I don't feel guilty at all. You're welcome. <laughs> Jesus, I'll go to church Sunday morning for you, but don't you expect me to come back Sunday night. Could you really say that to him while he hung on the cross? When he said to forsake not the assembling of ourselves. Listen, I don't know a person in their right mind that would say, going to church too much messed my life up. I know some people that said, I, because I didn't go to church. My life messed up. <laughs> right? Man, how many, how many people do we know that, man, if, if they were just raised in church, maybe they'd have had a better future. And yet we don't come back because it's our time. No, it's his time. It belongs to him. How about your time? Oh, by the way, yeah, we, were, we were out here in the parking lot yesterday and a couple, uh, I think a couple must have moved in the neighborhood. I've got to watch where they came from because I don't know. I'm walking some dogs, bloodhounds. You ever seen bloodhounds? Anybody ever seen a coon a, or tree a coon? Coon a tree? <laughs> <laughs> right, they start going. And boy, once they, once they smell, hit that scent, oh, yeah, yeah get going. <laughs> Smelling something. Yep. Come on. It's okay, I'm not going to bark again. <laughs> hey, not just giving God time, but actually enjoying it. Yeah, man. That's right. <laughs> There's some even right now. Here's your face. I don't like what he has to say. He said, who's he talking about? Don't worry about it. Just worry about if it's your face or not. Yeah. <laughs> Going to try to make us think. Hey, it's the scripture that said it. Yeah. How much is too much? It pleased the Father. Yeah. Is it really too much to ask God when he says, hey, to come back every time the doors, is it too much?
Well, listen, with our time. Hey, not only just our time. Uh, listen, how about, how about with our families? God expects us, hey men, God expects, expects us to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I was talking to a church planner just this week, and here's what he said this. He said, in our church, our biggest need is men. We got ladies everywhere, and they want to do everything. But to have men, he said, if we could just get some men in our church. Last time I checked, there, there's a mindset in the mind of men. Men are leaders. Anybody ever heard a man say this? I'm the head of my home. I make the rules. Yeah, but you don't follow them. Yeah. Hey. Did you, yeah. Did you hear about that fellow that, that went to heaven? And the Lord says, hey, I want every man that, uh, uh, that, that, listen, every man that raised his children for the Lord, that was faithful in church, that served God, that, that loved his wife. I mean, the, the, and he gave all these things. You know, you get in this line, every other man, I want you to get in this line. Every man got over here, except for one. One man got over there, and Peter looked at him and said, Really? You led your wife and you led your family and you, 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 you and he began to list all those things. He said, you did all that? He said, can, can you, I want you to tell these men over here how you did that. And that man said, I, I don't know, really. He said, I'm just over here because my wife told me to get over here. <laughs> hey, and the sad part is that's the majority of men today. Hey, men, the Bible says husbands, we're supposed to, fathers, raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Hey, if not do what I say, they're going to do what you do. And when you put God on the back burner or God is not important to you, you expect God to be important to your children? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Hey, we need men who are faithful to God. Men today want to act like a king, but they don't want to lead. Last time I checked, a king is a leader, yeah. not just a position. Right. See, we want the position without, without the responsibility. Hey, you come serve me. Woman, I need some more water. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Try that. You'll get some water. Hey, fire hydrant. <laughs> hey, man. The mindset today, they're either that, they're either, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, you're in, and put everybody under their foot. Why don't you just get up and lead like a man instead of tell everybody how much of a man. By the way, if you have to tell everybody you're a man, maybe you're not. I'm the head of my home. If you have to tell everybody all the time you're the head of your home, maybe you are not. Right? You understand? And you say, how much is too much for men to be men the way God expected us and lead our homes by example, yeah, by faithfulness, to raise our children and nurture? Hey, let me, let me tell you this. Y'all are listening slow this morning. <laughs> the church is not responsible to raise your children to know God. Yeah, you are responsible. If your children don't know God, it's your fault. You say, well, that's kind of harsh, isn't it? But I mean, we bring them to church. No, no. The church should reaffirm what you're teaching at home. When you teach them at home, the Bible says to, that we raise our children in nurture and admonition of the home or, or of the Lord. And what we teach our children, they're supposed to come to church and the preacher repeats what you've been telling your kids at home. And listen, the, the, that, that's when daddy can go home and go, mm-hmm, you just thought I was crazy, didn't you? <laughs> just be lucky you're not raising that preacher's house. Hey, we need men to lead. The Bible tells us of the virtuous woman whose price is far above rubies in Proverbs 31. The ladies thought they were going to get off the hook. I say today, ladies want to be treated like ladies, priceless, precious. Yet, let me ask you, 
In Proverbs 31, how much of the virtuous woman are you living? One time we went to a homestead village one time uh, down by Waco and they had a little pottery place, you know, and they had the old fashioned, you know, potter's wheel and there was somebody there just grabbing that thing and, you know, molding that. Can you imagine me making a vase? I did it back in like junior high one time. How many of you have ever been on that potter's wheel and you start doing it and you just, oh, one more, one more little um, indention right here and all of a sudden, <laughs> should have left it alone. Imagine if it flung all off and phew, hit the wall and you just picked it up and you bring it back and you're like, I want to put it in the kiln. Like that? Like that. <laughs> it's precious. It's one of a kind. There's none like it upon the entire earth. Well, yeah, it's junk. You imagine you put it in the kiln and you heat that thing up and, hey, you put that, 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 that stuff on there and make it all shiny and nice and it, it's got all the precious paint on there, but it's just blah. And then we take it to a fine, uh, a fine goods store and you put it on the shelf and you put a price tag of some very expensive vase. I wonder how many people would buy it. You say, what are you talking about? Hey, ladies, you want to be treated precious and priceless, but the Word of God tells you how you're supposed to live. And a woman who honors God and loves God enough to do those things, she is priceless. Listen, you let God shape you on that potter's will. You let him mold you, and I promise you, your life's not going to spin out of control and hit the wall. And when he gets done with you, listen, he puts you through the refiner's fire. And before you know it, listen, he puts set you out on the shelf. And I promise you, listen, you're that kind of a woman that loves God and honors God and loves her husband and honors her husband and loves her family and, and raises her children and listen, does those things right. Listen, there's not somebody that's going to walk by and say, listen, I, I wouldn't be willing to pay for that. You understand what I'm saying? See, we want to be treated a certain way, but we don't want to live the way that takes to get it. Hey, kids. Children, honor thy parents, right? We're supposed to obey our parents, right, kids? Hey, kids, how, how many of you know the Bible says you're supposed to obey your parents? One, two, three, four. Okay, there's a few. All right, good. There's some more. Aiden, you didn't know that? All right. You want me to show you? You sure? We'll go there. All right. Children. Yeah. Obey your children or obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Yeah. Hey, kids, can I just remind you for a moment? Hey, mom and dad aren't perfect. They're going to make mistakes, and they're, hey, listen, they're going to have faults, and they're going to have failures just like you. And can I just remind you, hey, the Bible says you're still supposed to obey them. Yeah, but mom and dad aren't doing everything right either. God never said you obey your parents if they're doing what's right. They said you obey your parents, period. Well, you know what? I would obey my parents, but, you know, God has never put a caveat in the Scripture for you to obey his, your parents. Amen. Never. The, the only caveat you might be able to get is if your parents tell you to do something that dishonors God, then you honor God above your parents. But I don't think your parents have done that. How do you know that? Because they brought you to church. Huh. You know what? When mama says clean your room, you know what God expects? God expects mama to tell you one time. And then, listen, when mama's told you one time, now you know your room is supposed to be clean. Mama shouldn't have to tell you again. By the way, hey, kids in Children's Church, just so you know, when I preach Children's Church, I'd preach on this stuff often. Oh, yeah. And I'd preach just like this. And you're like, Shh, I'm glad he wasn't in our Children's Church. <laughs> hey, listen, if your job, your responsibility is to take out the trash, you know it. They shouldn't have to tell you every day, take out the trash. And when they tell you to take out the trash, they didn't say, put your hand on top of it and smash it down while more can fit in. What did they say? Take out the trash. Hey, girls, when mama says, hey, do the laundry, fold the clothes, put them away, hang them up. You know what? The Bible says you're supposed to do that, and God expects you to honor your parents. Yeah, 
But that's too much. Listen, if you knew Jesus and saw all that he did for you, is it too much to honor your parents? Is it too much? Not at all, is it? There we go. Got it. Hey, and then one day, can I just remind you, we grow up. We turn 18. We move out of the house. I don't have to obey mom and dad no more. Can I just remind you, the Bible still says you're to honor your parents. You live in such a way that mom and dad would be proud, pleased. Is it too much? Hey, when you're out on your own, when you're hanging with your friends, when you're with the neighbors or you're with so-and-so, listen, if mom and dad would tell you don't do it, you shouldn't do it because it doesn't honor your parents. Period. So, well, I don't like that. Take that up with God. Kids today, hey, parents, have you noticed? Kids want everything. Anybody ever been to Walmart with that one kid? You saw that one kid and that one parent, shh, shh just be quiet. Shh, shh, just, okay, we'll give it to you later. Absolutely not. I, I, I'll be honest with you. If it wasn't for certain laws in today's society, it's, it's, not, it's not the kids that I want to whoop. I want to whoop the parents. <laughs> Say, listen, if you learn to do this right the right way, then maybe your kids wouldn't be doing that at three years old. Right. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he shall not depart from it. Is that what the scripture says? It is. Hey, spare the rod. All the adults know that one, right? <laughs> There's a right way to administer discipline to our children. And by the way, uh, kids, when mom and dad administer discipline to you, don't get mad at them and upset with them and think they hate you. They actually love you and they love you enough to do exactly what God said they're supposed to do. Can I say, listen, kids today, they want everything. Want, want, gimme, 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 gimme. And unfortunately, many parents give in to that want and that desire and they give it to them. And I remind you, kids, it's your, children, or your parents who are raising you. You're not raising your parents. And everything you have, you have it because your parents allowed you to have it. Do you have a roof over your head? You said, yeah, but it leaks. Where's the one you provided? Where's the one you got? You got clothes on your back? Yeah, but they're hand-me-downs. Where's the ones you bought? Yeah. Did you eat this morning? Yeah, but it was just oatmeal. Okay, go eat the food you bought. By the way, parents, I tell my kids that often. When they complain about I said, you don't have to eat what I bought. You can go eat what you bought. And they're done. They're done. You mean you say that? Yes, we do. When they complain about the clothes that I buy, I don't have to buy any more clothes in. You can wear everything you have until it wears out. When you're done with that, buy you some new ones. Well, I don't have any money. Well, you do why now? <laughs> done. We'll, we'll quit complaining about this really quick. You will be grateful for what I give you or I won't give you anything. God never said I had to give you name brand anything, period. My kid said, well, you're supposed to feed us. Hey, God didn't tell me what I'm supposed to feed you. Right? Beans and rice every day for a week. Doesn't sound good, Audrey? Yeah. Come on over and complain about what we eat. She's like, no. See, see how that works, parents? Well, she's not the picky one. She's not the picky one. Yeah, but she don't want beans and rice. <laughs> you see? Did you hear that? Yeah. We, we eat. Take what you get. You don't throw a fit. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm running behind here. Faithful to God. Hey, kids, God expects us to do these things. Is it too much to ask? Doesn't matter if you're a teenager or if you're six years old. Let me conclude this. This morning I actually have more. <laughs> Two more pages. I knew when I made the font smaller, it was, it was going to be a bad deal. <laughs> Would you ever look at Jesus and say it's too much? I've given too much to Jesus. With his blood pouring down his side. 
the blood coming down his head, the nails in his hands and his feet, looking at him with the splinters in his back, is anything too much? I want to conclude with this. Jesus, in John chapter 17, tells, the Bible tells us that he knelt down in the garden of Gethsemane. The night before he was betrayed. The interesting thing about Jesus, he's so much God, he knew what tomorrow would hold. Yep. That's right. He knew how much pain he was going to endure. He knew exactly how many stripes would be upon his back. He knew who would hit him. Yep. And he knelt down. And he asked this question. Lord, if there be any other way, would you remove this cup from me? And I almost hear the Holy Spirit of God speaking to his heart. As you understand, he is one part of the Godhead. There is no other way. I almost hear the Father in heaven looking down at him saying, there is no other way. And then Jesus as he knelt there, hearing that response. In his humanity, thinking this is too much. But his love for you and me said, Nevertheless, Amen. not my will, but thine be done. Good. Amen. When you begin to say it's too much, I wonder, is it your will or God's will? Come on. How much is too much? If you could see him on the cross, would you really say it's too much? You've lived too much for Jesus. You've read too much of your Bible. You've prayed too much. You've been faithful too much. You loved your wife too much. You loved your husband too much. You raised your children for God too much. Really? I fear this as we stand before him one day, as he sits upon the throne, and we kneel down before him. I fear every one of us will say, Lord, I didn't do enough. Amen. After all you did for me. For all the times I came to you and I prayed. I begged for help and grace and mercy. After all the sins I'd ever committed and you'd forgive me of every one of them. Your spirit would bring me comfort and joy, and peace. I did not do enough for you. And I have fear that we'll stand before him. Say, Lord, as the songwriter said, I wish I had given him yep. more. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much <laughs> for all that you've done for us. And we don't understand, as hard as we try, we don't understand how it pleased you to see the travail of your son's soul. But we're the recipients of your sacrifice. And God, oft times in life, someone looks at us when we make decisions for God and they say, you've gone too far, you've done too much. And even times when we sit in the pews, we hear the preacher preach the word of God and we say, that's just too far, it's too much. The honest truth is, Lord, I don't think we can go too far for you. If we stay on track with your word and live according to your principles and your precepts, if we please you, if we live by faith, if we love others, if we love you as we're supposed to, if we're good stewards with our lives, God, we just we do nothing but please you. And we cannot do too much. Would you help us this morning? Maybe in our lives, maybe it'd be one of the adults or one of our teenagers, one of our children. Maybe there's been some decisions they've been making that are dishonoring to you. This morning, would you help them to see the cross? Would you help them to see that you had to pay for that sin? And you suffered for that sin. You forgave them of that sin. And you loved them enough to allow them to hear this message that they might come back to you and receive forgiveness and get back up and try again. Heads are bowed this morning and eyes closed. Nobody looking around. I wonder if 
can you honestly say, preacher, if I died in my seat just like that, I know that I know heaven's my home. I know that I'm saved. If you can give testimony of that, would you do so by the uplifted hand? Preacher, I'm saved and I know it. God bless you. All over the auditorium, there's hands that are raised. You can put your hands down. I want to someone say, preacher, I don't know for sure. Would you pray for me? Is there anybody in here like that this morning? Preacher, I don't know for sure. Heaven's my home. Would you pray for me? Anybody this morning like that? Anybody at all? Anybody at all? I wonder if there's someone here this morning, maybe you've thought those very things. you thought it's too much. I wonder if God spoke to your heart this morning. And you begin to see Jesus upon the cross and realize, you know what, it's not too much for him. You say, preacher, that's me. Pray for me. Anybody here like that this morning? I see your hand and yours and yours. I see yours and yours. Yes, yes, ma'am, you see yours. Yes, sir, I see your hand. Yes, sir, I see yours. Thank you for being honest. Yes, sir, I see your hand. Yes, sir, I see your hand. Anybody else? Preacher, Lord spoke to my heart this morning. Please pray for me. Anybody else? I see your hand. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am, I see your hand. Thank you. Anybody else? Lord, I come to you this morning on behalf of those to whom you've spoken. Lord, you know the burdens that they carry, the heartaches, the questions, the doubts, the fears. And Lord, you're speaking to them right now more than likely about a very particular situation. Times in their life they've looked up to heaven and they begin to say this situation in life is just too much for me to bear. Would you help them, Lord? Would you help them to see all that you bore for them? And Lord, that through the storms of life that they're going through to rely upon your strength, to trust in you, to walk with you, and God, to know that you bore everything for them. Lord, I pray this morning you'd help us not just to come to church and become emotional and walk, out, walk away, but God, help us to make life-changing decisions, to choose to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, to help you or allow you to help us to be faithful until your soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. As the piano plays this morning, maybe God spoke to your heart and you need to come spend some time with him at the altar. Maybe you rose your hand you said, Preacher, would you pray for me? Hey, can I say I prayed for you, but would you come and pray for you this morning? Maybe it seems like it's been too much for you. But God has said, hey, I'm with you. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Maybe this morning, hey, you come and spend some time with God this morning. Maybe the truth is you say, you know what? I haven't been doing too much. I know I've been doing too little. Maybe God's speaking to you about your home. Hey, men, have we been the men that God wants us to be? Ladies, have we been the ladies that God wants us to be? Kids, have we been the kids that God wants us to be? I know that in every home there's situations and events that, that people don't know about. I know in every home, listen, there's heartaches and there's burdens. I promise you there's, there's, they're in my home is just like they're in your home. But I know this, there's a God in heaven that said he'd help us. He'd strengthen us. He'll lead us. He'll guide us. Maybe this morning you've said it's too much. I can't do it. Would you come and recommit your life to Jesus Christ this morning? Recommit to live according to his principles. To how he wants you to live. Maybe this morning you've been falling beneath the weight. You've taken your eyes off of Jesus. I just want you to see Jesus this morning. I want you to see what he did for you. I want you to see how much he loves you. I want you to see how much he endured for you. When we talk about Jesus down the cross, it wasn't just the fact that one day he had a few nails in his hands and a nail in his feet. He hung there for a few hours and it, just a very simple thing. It was a very traumatic experience. If you'd have been there that day and seen it with your eyes, 
it would have made an uh, impression upon your life so strong. So how do you know? Look what the church did in the book of Acts. That Jesus they saw hanging upon the cross, they watched him get out of a tomb and showed himself before them. They saw everything he had endured. They saw his suffering. They saw the blood. They saw him and they said, there's no way he's dead. He's gone. And when he got up and walked out, you know what? It showed to them, this is God. This is the same God that wants to use us. And this is the same God that wants to strengthen us and lead us and to guide us. And you know what? They were on fire. You think coming back Sunday night, that's too much? Go back to the book of Acts daily. Daily, they were in the temple and house to house. Hey, they ceased not to preach and teach Jesus Christ. And can I just remind you, hey, back then it was daily and, and, and there were no less busy than what we are today. You said, what, you, what makes you say that? Hey, you realize they didn't have dishwashers. They didn't have indoor plumbing. They didn't have electricity. Hey, they didn't have the tools that you men use on the job. Hey, they didn't have tractors. Hey, you realize they did everything by hand? Ladies, they washed by hand. You realize they didn't go down to the local Walmart? They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have a, all these things that brought us, quote unquote, more time. And yet today we have less time than ever before for God. How is that? Because we waste a lot of time. We waste it. I promise you there's enough time in your week for you to accomplish everything that God expects you to do. If we'll not waste our time. Maybe this morning you say, you know what, preacher, that's me. I don't give God his time because I've been wasting it. I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to come to church. I don't have time to go to prayer meeting. I don't have time to go soul winning. And really, if I look at my life, there's some time that I've been wasting. I could be doing other things. Is it too much to ask for us to say, God, you're first? Is it too much? Years ago, I decided that if it was in the Word of God, it's true. I was going to believe it. A lot of things I've learned through the Bible. One of the things that helped me was when I began to learn that what Jesus went through for me was true. When he died, it, it was real. When he suffered, it was real. When the scripture says, with his stripes, we are healed. We just read it. It was real. And I said, Lord, if you can do that for me, what can I do for you? Amen. Now, here's why we don't ask that question. Because we're afraid he's going to answer. I remember he told me, he said, when I first got saved, well, go to Sunday school like you said you were going to go. <sighs> I was going to go to church. He said, go to Sunday school. Then he said, go back Sunday night. <sighs> okay. Next thing I know, he said, uh, you know, Wednesday night when you're just sitting around the house playing video games? You could be at church. Maybe I shouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> Next thing I know, Thursday night when I was just messing around, he said, hey, you know what? Go soul winning. Yeah, oh, that's too much. That's too much. But then I look at Jesus and go, never mind. It's not enough. Yeah, it's not enough. Would we look unto Jesus this week? Yes, sir. Glad to help. Good, man. Thanks for calling me. Told you to. And, uh, so grateful to be there. I did forget one thing this morning. Go ahead and be seated for just a second. I won't take long. 
Famous last words of a preacher, right? We sang to Melissa on Wednesday. But today is Emma's birthday. So Emma, you must come before us. So we can sing happy birthday to you. So you come on up. And uh, Mrs. Lee's birthday is just right around the corner. Just uh, on the 11th. Mrs. Lee, if you'll come as well. We want to go and sing happy birthday to you. And uh, so now is there any other person that has a birthday in May that we don't know about? Christopher, really? Okay. Well, he's in the nursery. And uh, Christopher. Yeah, this is on. Okay. Christopher, if you can hear me. We're going to sing happy birthday to you, Christopher. It may be loud in the nursery, but now you hear your name. Christopher, we're going to sing to you. Anybody else? If you've turned the, the volume down in the nursery, shame on you. <laughs> Let's sing to these folks happy birthday. And by the way, today is, Emma, how old are you today? Double digits. We won't ask Mrs. Lee. And uh, we don't ask ladies anymore. Well, I quit doing that a long time ago. So let's sing happy birthday to these ladies. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday. Well, amen. Hope you all have a wonderful birthday. Christopher, I hope you have a wonderful birthday, too. What day is Christopher's birthday? 23rd. Wow. Towards the end of the month. And so, amen. Well, let's stand now and uh, let you be seated so you can sing. And uh, also so the ladies can be more, 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 for all standing while we sing to them, it's not as embarrassing, right? And so, hope to see you tonight. Prayer meeting at 530. Services at 6 o'clock. You say, that's too much. Amen. Hope to see you tonight. And uh, let's pray. Ask for those blessings as we dismissed. And uh, as we pray, Isaiah, would you ask the Lord?